Good afternoon <clears throat> and happy Sabbath one and all. Um, for, for, for us to begin, let me start with a, a scripture. Um, so reading a couple of verses from uh, Psalms 33. Uh, it says, Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Praise the Lord with harp, sing unto him with the psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. For the word of the Lord is right, and all the works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of, good, of the goodness of the Lord. So verse 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. So as I said, happy Sabbath one and all. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome all our regular visitors. And I believe uh, our elders, our mother is here, Sister Joyce. We welcome you for joining us. Um, and all of the uh, other families of Bilston, welcome. We hope and pray that uh, you have a blessed Sabbath day and enjoy the uh, regular worship and fellowship that we have. To commence our service, uh, we will have hymn number 294, Power in the Blood. Uh, you feel free to sing along, but please keep your machines on mute. Thank you. Now time for our scripture reading. Our scripture reading today is taken from Exodus 
the book of Exodus, the 12th chapter. A, a familiar, a very familiar story. But, you know, sometimes I think that the more familiar we become with the story, the less we really pay attention to the various elements of the story because we because we know it so well. We don't really heed the significance of what we are reading or what we think we know. And as I studied this story this past week, what a wonderful, wonderful, symbolic, rich, message-filled story we have in the book of Exodus. The scripture reading is taken from Exodus chapter 12. We're going to read from verse 1 to verse 14. I'm reading in the King James Version. Please follow in whatever version that you have. Exodus chapter 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And he shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head, with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, with your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste, it is the Lord's Passover." For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Here ends the reading of the word of God. I pray that God would give us understanding as we meditate on these words. Amen. This time, can we bow and kneel where appropriate as we seek the Lord in prayer? We just bow our heads. Nothing can find in nothing. Thank you so much for the opportunity of giving to us one more time to come before your throne of grace. We know, Lord, that we are frail, that we are easily broken. And many of us here at this time are broken in spirit and in various ways. We ask, Lord, that you will come to us and heal us and put us back together 
we know the situation that we now find ourselves in is one that we did not envisage ourselves to be in. But Lord, you knew about it. And we ask that you will give us the strength to go on. We ask too, Lord, that you will help us to trust you. Help us to build our faith up so that during this time, we will come to know you as our Saviour. Lord, we ask that you will be with the many families who are suffering for various reasons. We ask that you will come close to them, those who are sick, those who are having financial difficulties, those who are having other problems. We ask, Lord, that you will be there for them. Help them to see that you are there too and that you can do all things. And so, Lord, we ask that you will be not just with us, but with our communities and with the leaders. We ask, Lord, that you will speak through them and to them and help them too to come to know you. And so, Lord, we also ask that you be with our speaker today. You know how to care. You know you have used him in the past and you're continuing to use him. We ask that you will speak to him and through him to each and every one of us because you know what our needs are. And therefore, loving Father, as we bow before you, we ask that you will hear our prayers and that you will forgive each and every one of us where we have sinned. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We will now have our children's story uh, told to us or presented by Sister Carey. In fact, as a good leader, I've delegated to Sister Forster and she will be taking the children's story for us. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, good morning. So, morning so um today's children's story will be a video so please can you all make sure that you can see the screen properly please and it's actually based on the sermon god's story passover so part of god's story is about passover and it goes like this it all started when the israelites were stuck as slaves in egypt they were forced to work in fields and make bricks and mortar Worse, the ruler of Egypt, Pharaoh, and the other people in charge didn't care if God's family was hot or tired or hungry or sad or hurt or just plain miserable. And they were. But even in the middle of all that, God's family grew. In fact, they got so big that Pharaoh was scared they might attack and overpower him. He made them work even harder to show them he was boss. Soon the Israelites were even more miserable. They begged God for help. Well, guess what? God saw what Pharaoh was doing to his family, and he didn't like it one bit. So he planned a rescue. He sent a man named Moses to lead God's family out of Egypt and into a brand new, beautiful home called the Promised Land. But when Moses told Pharaoh to let God's family leave, Pharaoh said no. Remember, Pharaoh thought he was the boss. The thing is, God is really in control, and even rulers of countries should obey him. So nine different times, God sent plagues to show Pharaoh his power. The plagues were like punishments to Egypt for keeping God's family as slaves. After each one, Moses asked Pharaoh to let God's family go, but Pharaoh kept saying no. Then Moses told Pharaoh that God loves his family so much that he will rescue them no matter how many times Pharaoh refused to obey. So there would be one more plague, one that would wipe out the oldest son in every house in Egypt. But of course, God had a special plan for his family. He told them to take their best lamb or young goat, kill it, and paint the blood on the doorframe. Then they should eat the meat with bitter herbs and some flat bread made without yeast called unleavened bread, which is cheap and can be made quickly. In fact, God asked his family to eat the whole meal as if they were ready to run right out the door with their shoes on and their walking sticks in hand. They obeyed. Good thing too, because that very night the angel of death came. But just like God promised, he passed over the houses with blood on the door. Finally, Pharaoh realized God was in charge and that God loved his family, and that Pharaoh couldn't stop God's rescue plan. He said God's family should get far away from Egypt. 
they left in a hurry. For hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years after that, God's family celebrated the night God rescued them by eating unleavened bread, bitter herbs, and lamb. But that rescue was just a preview to the big rescue God had planned for the whole world. Remember, the ruler of this world, the devil, wants us to work for him and live bitter, sad lives, separated from God. And we all do wrong things sometimes and deserve to die as punishment. So God sent his very own son to earth. He lived the perfect life we should have lived and died the awful death we should have died. But three days after he died, Jesus came back to life. That means he got rid of death and it can't separate us from God anymore. And you know what? Right before Jesus died, he celebrated Passover one last time, but without the lamb. See, Jesus showed us that he is our lamb. And just like the lambs died so that the sons could stay with their families, Jesus died so that we can be part of God's family. One day he'll recreate a perfect home for us and it'll be even better than the promised land. And that's the story of Passover. So in case you missed it, here's the quick version. God's family was miserable. They begged God for help. God planned a rescue. Pharaoh said no. God showed his power. The oldest sons had to die. Lambs took their place. God rescued his family. They celebrated Passover. Death was our punishment too. God sent his son. He took our place. God rescued us. And that's a part of God's story. Um, thank you. Um, can we all just bow our heads now, please? Dear Father, Lord, um, thank you for sending Jesus to die for us. I pray that you send the Holy Spirit and help us to understand the sermon for today. Please help us take something from it so that we can share your word with other people and help them to understand more about you. Please be with Otis as he preaches. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Yes, uh, we are about to have a meditational song. And after the meditational, um, Elder Carey, who needs no introduction, uh, will deliver the message to us today. Amen. Amen. The, the blood will never, never lose its power. Before we get into the message for today, let us just have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, Father, you know all things. You know all things. Lord, you know how much we need the blood. Lord, you know how much I need the blood. You know what we need to hear from you today. And so, Father, I just invite you through the power of your Holy Spirit to speak Speak a word in due season, Lord, we ask, and we thank you for what you will do in Jesus' name. Amen. You'll be glad to know that the message I have for you today is a very brief message. It's a very brief message, a very, very brief message. It will take me only a few minutes to actually speak the message. But before I get to the message, I need to just lay the groundwork beforehand. And that will take me a little longer. You know, we are, where are we? The 9th of January. The 9th of January. Um, still, we would consider it a new year, yes? And anybody who knows me knows that I'm not a big Christmas person. I'm not a big Christmas person at all. Never have been and likely never will be. My mom can certainly attest to that. However, new year would normally be a time where I could manage to find a little bit more excitement about New Year. There's always been something that intrigues me about the idea of a new dawn, a new beginning, a new opportunity of life. And how often do we approach this time of the year with a dream, a hope, which is just reinvigorated because the, the date turned from December to January. How much more so than the turn from 2020 to 21, where people were so hopeful, 
so looking forward to seeing saying goodbye to 2021 in the hope or in the belief that 2021 would be a completely new thing, a completely new dawn where we could just forget about all the things that happened in 2020 and then 2021 would just be a brand new day. Unfortunately, what people found in reality was that 2021, so far, all it has to offer is much of the same. Much of the same. You know, if, if you're not careful, you can find yourself feeling sorry for yourself if you're not careful. And so as I was studying this week, an elder texted me not so long ago asking me to speak on the 9th. I thought, what will I talk about today? And what I discovered in the Bible was that there were some people who were having a much harder time of it than we are. A much harder time of it. Now, if we go to our scripture for the day in Exodus, at this time, we have a people, the Israelites, who are in slavery in, in Egypt. Now, you know, some of us, we think we have it tough right now. And even yesterday, I found myself moaning, complaining to my wife, having a rant, because I was telling her, I was ranting, we were walking around the supermarket, and I was saying, I'm sick. I'm sick of people telling me what to do. I'm sick of the shopkeep, the shop people in the shop telling me what to do. I'm sick of the government telling me what I can and can't do. I'm just sick of, sick of people telling me what to do. And then when I thought about it, I thought, really, I would really struggle as a slave. Really, really struggle in slavery. You know, in Genesis, I'm sorry, in Exodus, we read how the Egyptian people looked on the Israelites and they realized that there were so many of them and they were so strong and in good health and they thought, wow, mine sharp, if we're not careful, our slaves are going to overtake the land and overtake us in our own land. So what we need to do, we need to change some things and treat them more harshly to keep them in subjugation. The Bible says that the Egyptian slave masters, they made their lives, the Israelites' lives, bitter with hard bondage. Bitter with hard bondage. And if that wasn't enough, the Pharaoh, he passed a decree that every woman who gives birth to a male child, that the child should be taken and thrown in the river. And so, brethren, you might think that you're having a tough time right now because you can't go and take your loved one out for a nice candlelit bite to eat. And there are restrictions on who you can have to your home and whose home you can go to. But these guys, they were having a really tough time, a really tough time. The Bible says that they were being beaten. And because the Pharaoh wanted to make their lives harder, rather than giving them the things that they needed to make the bricks in their slave labor, they were sent to go and find their own materials. But the daily target of bricks was still the same. They were having it tough. But I want to cast your mind to a couple of texts. Go with me to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. In Genesis chapter 15, I just want to remind us and bring our attention to a promise that God made. Genesis chapter 15, verse 13 and 14, it says, And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. And again, if we go to Exodus chapter 3, Exodus chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, it says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people 
which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. And the reason that I highlight this text is because I just want to reassure us today. We see in Exodus chapter 6, God hears the cry of his people. God heard the cry of the people. He says that God in Exodus 6 verses 5 to 8, he says that God heard the groaning of the people and he remembered the covenant that he made with them. And he says, he will deliver them. I'm sure that there may be someone here today who needs to be reminded of the fact God hears your groaning. And so some of us maybe because of the pandemic situation, our financial situation has been impacted, our work situation. But I'm just here to remind you that God is, God hears your groans. He hears your groans. Some of us are groaning about feeling isolated or feeling lonely. God hears your groans. Some of us are looking at world events and are perplexed and fearful and confused. God is reassuring us today. God hears your groans. God remembers. And as he promised in Deuteronomy chapter 316, that he will never leave you or forsake you. It's this promise that Dave, David was thinking about when he wrote in the Psalms that although he walks through the valley of the shadow of death, he will fear no evil because God is with him. In Exodus chapter 6, verse 6, depending on what version that you have, it says that God will redeem his people with a stretched out hand. Now, I want you to, to keep the word redeemed, redeem in the back of your head. We'll come back to that later. But where it says with a stretched out hand, what it actually means is that God will redeem his people with his mighty power, with mighty power. And so though you might be tossed to and fro with the events that are going on in the world right now, just remember that God hears your groans. And at the appointed time, God will redeem his people with his mighty power. Now, we know the story very well. Now, I'm not at the message yet, but I'm getting to the message. I'm getting to the message. We're familiar with the story. God says to Aaron and Moses, go to Pharaoh, tell him to let my people go, my firstborn go. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he wouldn't let them go. And so as we know, one plague after another, after another fell on Egypt. First of all, we have the plague of blood where Aaron lifted his rod and all the water in the land turned to blood. All the fish in the sea died. And the Bible says that it stank all through the, the land of Egypt. And then we have the plague of frogs. Aaron again lifted his rod and the frogs overtook the land. Now, I want you to just, even if you have to close your eyes and just picture, because, again, some of us are sitting in our homes and genuinely feeling sorry for ourselves now. But I want you to think, imagine if you're, in, if you're the Egyptian people and you're in your house and frogs are coming through the door. It said that frogs were in the oven, in the bedroom, in the bed, even on the people themselves. So even now we're sat here having a conversation. Frogs are, frogs are all over, jumping here and there and everywhere. These guys really had it tough, really had it tough. This was not enough. The next plague was the plague of lice. So lice, the Bible says, was, were everywhere on man, on beast, and all the dust of the earth became lice. Pharaoh still would not let the people go. And so a plague of flies swarmed the land of Egypt. The servants were covered with flies. The houses were covered with flies. Flies all across the face of the earth. 
the next plague was a plague on cattle, horses, donkeys, camels, sheep, goats, all the livestock of the Egyptian died. The next plague, and I'm, I'm getting to the message, we're coming to the message, but I just have to lay the, the scene. The next plague was a plague of boils, boils and painful sores all over the body of the Egyptians. And you know, the Bible says that the magicians who before this point, all the, the plagues, all the things that Aaron was doing with his rod, the majority of them, the magicians of the land did the same thing. But when the boils fell, the magicians were in so much pain on their feet and on their legs that they couldn't even stand, it says, before Moses and Aaron. And then the next plague which fell because heart, Pharaoh still hardened his heart. A plague of locusts. It says that locusts covered the land so much so that you couldn't see the ground. They filled Pharaoh's house, the house of his servants, all the Egyptian homes, and they consumed whatever the hail didn't kill in the field. The, I'm sorry, I've missed the hail. The hail what came after the boils. Thunder and hail and fire. Now, you know, when we had the beast from the east a few years ago, this is no beast from the east. Imagine if there were hails the size of small animals falling out of the sky and thunder and fire coming up from the ground. This is going to be a fearful sight. This is going to be a... I mean, at the moment, we're living in a time where we can scarcely believe what we are seeing and hearing around us. But you can imagine if this was happening, it would be mind-blowing, mind-blowing, fire coming from the sky and from the ground. And then you had the locusts. The ninth plague, the plague of darkness. The Bible says that the, there was thick darkness in the land for three days. It says that the darkness was a type of darkness which you could, could be felt. You could feel the darkness. Now, natives of this country may not really have ever experienced proper darkness. Proper darkness. See, in this country, when it gets dark, there's normally always some ambient light somewhere diluting the darkness. And so it's really hard to find anywhere on these aisles where it's really dark. But those of you who come from places like the Caribbean, you understand when it is dark, it's truly pitch, pitch black. But the Bible goes one further than that. It says that this darkness, you could touch it, you could feel it. It was so dark. But this was not enough for Pharaoh to let the people go. We're getting to the message very soon. We're coming to the message. Finally, God said to Moses and Aaron, I am going to kill the firstborn of everybody in the land. I am going to kill the firstborn of everybody in the land. And after I do that, then Pharaoh will let the people go. And so God said, what I need you to do is to take a lamb, a male of the first year, as we read, without blemish, without spot. On the 10th day of the month, you set aside the lamb. And on the 14th day, everybody was to kill the lamb and take the blood and apply it to the doorposts on the side of the doorpost out, out the front door, across the top, on the other side. They were to roast the lamb with bitter herbs, not to be cooked in water. So this is not going to be a casserole. This was going to be roast lamb with bitter herbs because this was not a celebration dinner. This was not a celebration dinner. And they were to eat it with unleavened bread. There was no leaven to be seen in the homes at this time. If there was too much lamb for you, you must invite your neighbors to come together and we will have one whole lamb. No bones are to be broken of this lamb. And we will eat the flesh and nothing was to remain until the morning. 
okay, here is the message. Here is the message. Captivity in Egypt represents bondage to sin. Bondage to sin. Pharaoh represents the enemy of God. The Israelites represent God's, our God's people, you and me. The lamb represents Jesus Christ. The plagues represent God's warnings and judgments to a dying earth. The death of the firstborn represents God's final judgment. Brethren, and this is the message, this world is not our home. This world is not our home. This life of sin and suffering is not or should not be for us. We were sold into sin by our father, Adam. All of Earth's history since that point is simply a manifestation of the struggle between Christ and Satan. The truth is that God wants to free us from a life of sin. And just as Pharaoh, if you read the scripture, and I encourage you to do so, read the first 13 chapters of Exodus. Pharaoh did everything in his power to resist and to keep the, the children of Israel in bondage. But God has made a way of escape. God has made a way of escape. Brethren, soon, God is going to judge the inhabitants of this earth. God is going to judge the earth and the inhabitants thereof. But in his mercy, in mercy, he allows warnings to come so that we will be woken up from our slumber. We will see the time that it is and we will make a decision to follow him. Come with me to Romans chapter 6 and verse 16. Romans 6, verse 16. I will tell you what it says. It says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his Servants which should say, slaves ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So the Bible is saying that, do you not know that according to the actions that you perform, according to your behaviors, you are yielding yourself as a servant or a slave to your master? And so if we are performing deeds of righteousness, we are servants or slaves of Christ. But if we are performing deeds of sinfulness, we are servants or slaves to sin, slaves to Satan. Now, I'm resisting the urge to get into a, a deep, complex discussion about some deep theological concepts such as expiation or propitiation or to get into the Hebrew roots of the concept of the kinsman redeemer. But I encourage you to do so. But let me say this. When you're a slave, you can't just walk free. Let me say that again. Romans chapter 6 verse 16 says that if we sin, we are slaves to sin, slaves to Satan. When you are a slave, you cannot just walk free. When you are owned by somebody else, you cannot just walk free. To be released, to be redeemed, somebody has to pay a price. To redeem you, to win you back, to, to, to gain your freedom, Somebody has to pay a price. You see, for the burden of sin, a price has to be paid. And let me tell you what the price is. 
you know, sometimes we just came from Christmas. I noticed, I think, I don't know what day we went to the shops, me and Suki, but the, they already had New Year's sales deep into December. And I was saying, wow, they must really be struggling here. But let me tell you this, you see this purchase here, this is never on sale, never on sale. It's never cheaper. The price to purchase somebody back, to redeem somebody from slavery to sin, it's never on sale. The price is blood. The price is blood. Blood representing the life of an individual. In our story, God paid the price for the release of the slaves. Somebody had to die. Something had to die. And so Pharaoh wouldn't let the people go. And God performed all these miraculous deeds. And eventually, <coughs> excuse me, taking the life of the firstborn of every household in Egypt, which did not, which was not covered by the blood. The Israelites would have had to spare their own firstborn to be released from Egypt, if not for the mercy of God. The Israelites, to be let go, they would have had to spare the lives of their own firstborn, but it was the mercy of God which said, when I see the blood, Exodus 12, 13, when I see the blood on the doorpost, I'm going to pass over you. I'm going to pass over you. The truth is, it should be me. It should be me. It should be you. It should be you. You're the price for my sin should be my blood. It should be. The price for your sin, it should be your blood. But praise the Lord, because of the blood of the Lamb, Jesus, God says, he will pass over you. He will pass over me. Are you covered by the blood of Jesus? Are your sins covered by the blood of Jesus? Am I covered by the blood of Jesus? Question, why does, how does the blood of Jesus cover sin? How or why does the blood of Jesus cover sin? It's because, and again, we don't have time to go through this deep study, but Study for yourself and see that the life, life is in the blood. Life is in the blood. The blood is the life and the life is in the blood. And so the, the blood of Christ covers sin because his life is in the blood. I read this statement this week. And you know, I love myself a bit of profundity. But the SDA Bible commentary, page 783, said that it's the blood which makes atonement because of the life that is in it. Christ's blood makes atonement because it represents his life. And this, don't miss this. Christ's death accomplished one purpose, but his life accomplished another purpose. And the two together assure us of salvation. His death paid the penalty and satisfied the claims of the law. But his life assures us life. The death, Christ's death paid the penalty, but his life assures us life. I would propose my belief that perhaps some of us 
have only ever taken advantage of one aspect of the blood of Christ. Perhaps some of us have only ever taken advantage of the one aspect of Christ's blood which washes away the stain of sin. But then the, the second aspect of Christ's blood, Christ's life, is that his life should become our life. His life should become my life. You know, when I started looking into this topic of the blood, a really interesting dichotomy uh, uh, occurred to me that the, the Israelites were told never to eat blood, never to eat blood. They were forbidden from eating anything with blood in or the blood of anything. And the consequences of doing so were normally death or to be cut off. It was a very serious declaration. Don't eat blood. However, Christians and followers of Christ are told to eat and drink his blood. And so when I first read this, I thought, that's strange. So all through the Bible, all through the Old Testament, and even the New, we're told never to eat the blood of any animal. But then Jesus himself says, unless you eat, drink my blood and eat my flesh, you have no part in me. John, let's go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. I mean, I'm finishing now. John chapter 6. The Bible says in John chapter 6, verse 53, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. So, I asked earlier, are you covered by the blood of Jesus? My next question is, are you feasting and dining on the flesh and the blood of Christ? Now, I know that I can see some vegetarians' faces are like, what? What is this? cannibalism that you're promoting today you know there are so many aspects of eating which are symbolic for this description here the truth of the matter is that when you eat something it becomes a part of you when i you you are what you eat you are what you eat a very true statement now if we were eating christ what would we be according to that statement so if you are what you eat, if you are eating Christ, what would you be? What would you, what would you, or how would you be? How would your life look? What would your life look like? How would your actions come across? John is not instructing us to become cannibals. John is saying, we need to allow the life of Christ to become our life to become our life allow the vitality in him to fill us and to become a part of us why am i speaking about this today we're at the beginning of a new year and as we read earlier the passover it was the it marked the beginning of the year for the Jews at the beginning of the year they were to perform this ceremony to remind them of the great act of redemption that Christ that God had done on their behalf they were to eat 
the lamb with their sandals on, with their rod in their hand, ready to go. And brethren, today I would encourage us to do the same. When we look at the place that we are in Earth's history, we should have that metaphorical spirit where we have our shoes on, our bag on, and we are getting ready to go. Ready to go at any minute, ready to go. But for us, for the, the destroying angel to be able to pass over us, we have to be covered with the blood of Christ. We have to be covered with the blood of Christ and not just our sins covered, but then after that, Christ's life needs to become my life, my life. And so at the beginning of this year, I don't know where you are in your spiritual walk, but if you want to say, Lord, I recognize that the price for my sin and for my freedom from the punishment of sin is death. Lord, I recognize that soon you will come to administer judgment on the earth. But I'm asking, Lord, according to the blood of Christ, pass over me. If that is your prayer, I just want you to raise your hand. And the second call, if you want to dine on the flesh and the blood of Christ and for his life to be your life. Let us pray. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm so grateful for what you have done for us, what we could never do for ourselves. Lord, our sin requires death, but even, even our own death would not pay the price, Lord, because to fulfill the law, we needed a spotless, sinless sacrifice. Lord, you gave the sacrifice. And Father, we just pray that you would apply the blood of Christ to our record so that when our records come up before you, Lord, it would just say, pardoned, pardoned, pardoned. But Lord, not only this, but please, Father, give us the life of Christ. Allow his life to course through our veins so that we can be witnesses for you to the end of the earth and then May the end come. Father, this is our prayer. Make it a reality in our lives, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And I'd like to thank Elder Taylor very much for this timely message, reminding us. I think the bit I can remember is about eating the blood. Right, and I think it could read my mind because I'm thinking I'm vegetarian. <laughs> yeah, but uh, how can I eat the blood when I don't eat it? You know, but you know, as it was pointed out, it's not really referring to the blood, blood, but it is what Christ has to offer, and that we should. Uh, take his word, we should eat his word, we should make it part of us, our diet, daily diet, so that we can become like Jesus. That's what the scripture tells us. I pray and I thank Elder Kira very much for that message for us, so at least we know what to eat now for lunch. And for dinner tonight, and for, for the weeks and months and years to come. You know, let's just dive into it, brethren. You know, it is a food that it can have it at any time, right? It will not give us digestion. It will not give us, I'm trying to think all of the words, then, but you know what it is. You will not get gas from it, nothing whatsoever. It will just give you strength as you eat it. Thank you very much. At this time, we will close our service with the use of him 336. There is a fountain filled with blood.
Latin, a well-known hymn says, look upon Jesus, sinless is he. Father, impute his life unto me. My life of scarlet, my sin and woe, cover with his life whiter than snow. Deep are the wounds transgression has made. Red are the stains, my soul is afraid. Oh, to be covered, Jesus, with thee, safe from the law that now judgeth me. Lord, this is our prayer. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we would be covered with his life, covered with the life of Jesus. Lord, I cannot be the only person who has looked on their own resources and looked on their own strength and their own ability, their own righteousness, and I've seen that there's a major deficit, Lord, a major deficit. And the truth is, Lord, that there's nothing that I have in myself that can redeem myself from the bondage of sin. There's nothing that I have, Lord, nothing that we have that can pay the price for our own soul. It's only through the blood of Jesus. And Lord, I just pray that you would continue through your mercy, by the power of your Holy Spirit, to do everything, Lord, that is necessary, to see us safely into your kingdom someday soon. And Lord, we take hope from the verse which says, Lord, that you are not slack concerning your promise, as some count slackness. But Lord, you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Lord, we lay all on the altar of sacrifice right now. And we pray, Father, and we thank you for doing what no man could do, only the blood of Jesus. Lord, may his cleansing blood be an experience in our life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.